Hey Tommy, you know what a dream car of mine is? What's that, Dad? The Porsche 911, and this last weekend we got to spend some quality time behind the wheel of the brand new 911 C4 Carrera 4 Targa. That's right, yeah, so the fine folks at Porsche lent us the new 911 for a few days to drive around in sunny California, and we got to find out what was good about it, what was not so good about it, and uh, we'll talk about all that in this podcast. Yeah, and we're going to take a deep dive into everything 911, and um, let's just get right to it, Tommy. So uh, we flew into LA and uh, took a ride over to the local Quick Park, uh, and uh, there was this shiny silver... 911 waiting for us, uh, a dream for me actually, uh, and especially to have a Targa uh, was so cool. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's uh, changed a lot because I think the last Porsche we actually had from Porsche was almost like eight years ago. It was a long time ago. And part of that is because Porsche doesn't typically send vehicles out to the Denver press fleets. So when we get these press cars, they come from a little fleet. Uh, that is stocked by the major manufacturers, but uh, it's just not a huge market, so Porsche doesn't necessarily stock like 911s and Macans and Cayennes in our area, which means that we have to travel to drive them. Yeah, and so to actually get behind the wheel of one uh, is a treat. So let's talk about the good, and then we'll talk about the bad, and then we'll kind of talk about actually our Porsche that we just bought, which we just did, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, so let's talk about the good first. Uh, it's a gorgeous car, Tommy. Well, it's one of the things that you either love or you're not so hot on. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a Porsche. It looks like a 911. This is the latest generation of 911, which is called the 992. And I've got the Wikipedia page pulled up. And basically what Porsche does is they add these funny three-digit uh, numbers next to the word 911, and that represents the model. So if you ever heard someone talk about like a 996, that's the first water-cooled Porsche. Which we owned. Yeah, and the 997 was the next one, and the 991, and now we're at 992. So if, if you hear us talking about those funny numbers, that's what that means. But the 992, uh, 2019 through the, the current model year, 2021. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a good-looking car, a really good-looking car, but it's definitely polarizing. I think people either really like it or they're like, eh, another 911. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, what makes an iconic car, Tommy, is the fact that the styling is evolutionary, not revolutionary. You think of other cars that have become iconic over the years. A G-Wagon comes to mind, right? Very few styling changes. And, you know, Jeremy Clarkson of Top Gear used to say that Porsche engineers are lazy because they don't change the design much. But I think when you've got something that works, why mess with success? And this latest generation, you know, the different generations, some are more successful than others. You mentioned the 996 had those fried egg headlights that people hated. Uh, it was a little... Uh, well, polarizing would be a nice way of saying it. Uh, ugly to a lot of Porsche enthusiasts would be the other way of calling it. But this generation, the latest generation, I think they really hit the mark. I mean, uh, you've got these incredible wide shoulders in the back. So when you're driving it and you're looking out the back, you see these giant haunches. And it's packing just a huge set of tires in the back. Uh, the front is sloped enough to make it uh, sporty, but yet still upright enough to give you incredible view out the front of it so you feel and you know where all the four corners are at. Uh, the interior, you know, they're never cutting edge, but actually the infotainment uh, is relatively usable. I would say, you know, we did a podcast recently where we talked about the best and worst infotainment, and I think Porsche's up there. It's, you know, it's its its, its own thing. It doesn't use Volkswagen, even though it's part of the Volkswagen group. Uh, I think the controls are all laid out. They do kind of a good mix of, you know, real buttons and virtual um, buttons or sliders. Um, you know, the seating position is extremely comfortable for somebody my size. Um, obviously, you've got two seats in the back that you could maybe get a bunch of young kids into if you had to. Uh, certainly good for luggage. It's got a frunk, uh, you know, and it's always had a frunk, which is cool. Uh, uh, and the Targa is just, uh, it's, it's like engineering uh, set to uh, music. It's that beautiful when it actually operates. So uh, why don't we start and just discuss the complete range of 911s because there are a lot of them. Yeah, it's pretty overwhelming. Um, let me go to the configurator here so you can kind of get, get the basic idea of how the, uh, the lineup works. But first of all, you have to decide if you want a two-wheel drive or a uh, all-wheel drive 911 because mm -hmm. those are different models. And then you have to decide on the kind of the performance level. So the base model is called the 911 Carrera. That starts at $99,200. From there, you have the 911. Isn't that funny how it just starts at just under 100K? Yeah, they wanted that just, just to yeah. uh, have a little under 100. Uh, from there, you've got the 911 Carrera 4. 
And then you get to the S version. So uh, the S is kind of the sharper, faster, um, a little bit more performance oriented version. So the 911 Carrera S. And then of course you've got the 911 Carrera 4S. So all of these are coupes, uh, but you can get every model I just said in a cabriolet version too, a convertible. So there's the C2, the C4, the C2S, and the C4S. Um, moving up from there, you've got the Targa. And the Targa is a model that dates back to like the mid-1960s. And it's a removable panel in those old cars that comes out of uh, the roof. And it just pops on out. And on the old cars, you had to you know, leave it at home or find a place to store it in the, in, the, in, the, in the trunk or something. But in the new 911, what happens is the whole rear glass portion slides open. And then that middle roof section actually pivots back into the rear cargo area. So it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. It's like kind of a half convertible, half coupe. But uh, the Targa is only available in four-wheel drive. So there's a 911 Targa 4, the 911 Targa 4S, and then there's a special edition. So that's your basic model lineup. Yeah, uh, but within that, there are many flavors of uh, vehicles because Porsche certainly does um, give you just a plethora of different options to choose from. And one of the things that Porsche is really good at, of course, is making sure uh, that uh, the stuff that they offer is stuff that you want and that the stuff that you want is going to cost some money. A lot of money, yeah. <laughs> and this is even before we talk about like the turbo models, and that's a whole other can of worms. They're also still basically 911s, but they're... They're kind of its own separate thing. But if we look at the one we had, right? So the 911 Targa 4. So here it is on the configurator. And it probably has more options and more specs that you can customize and build to your preference than any other car. So you have four standard colors. But if you want any other color than white, black, red, or, or yellow, you're going to have to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's just the beginning of the, of the options list, right? There's everything from, uh, oh, God, it's, it's endless, right? You can pick the kind of badges you want. You can have the traditional badge, you can de-badges, you can have uh, more, you know, like retro badges. Uh, you can have, I'm just kind of picking the more obscure options uh, out there. Uh, you can have a plethora of different wheels. Uh, you can change uh, whether you want clear, clear taillights or colored taillights. Uh, you can change pretty much everything. I mean, you can really make the car your own, uh, and all that's going to cost. I mean, there's four different seat options. There's something like 20 different interior options. I think there's six or seven different wheels. Um, you can get stickers on the side. You can get Carrera on the side. You can get Carrera on the back. You can get 911 on the back. But the cool thing is, is if you're an enthusiast, you can really spec out your dream car to exactly the spec you want. You're not just pulling someone else's dream car from the lot. You can make it specifically uh, that car that you've always dreamed about. Now, the one we drove started at 119,000. Yep. But, but yeah. As but. as spec, I think it was 142,000, and that isn't anywhere near the top of the the Targa 4 range. I mean, that was just a Targa 4, not even a Targa 4S. So it didn't even have the S performance, for example. Uh, and you could have even spec the basic Targa 4 well beyond that. I mean, it's pretty incredible. Uh, for example, Porsche does. They, they do charge for things that would be standard in a lot of other cars. So like power folding mirrors, right? That's a $370 option. Um, it's stuff like heated seats you have to pay for. Um, even some of the safety equipment, like I think to get blind spot monitoring in ours, that was an option where on like any entry level Toyota would have that, right? Uh, adaptive cruise control is another big option. Um, you have like four different types of lights. If you want your tail lights clear, that's an option. Um, if you want a surround view camera, that's an option. Adaptive cruise control is two grand, two thousand dollars for adaptive cruise control. Uh, there's lane change assist. Um, there's uh, all, just so many little things that you typically find standard on a normal car, but Porsche makes you really spec out each individual option. So that's the downside of having so many different potentials. But the upside is, is I mean, you could go crazy with the seatbelt colors and the seat colors and the stitching deviation. I mean, it's really the world is your oyster if you can afford it. Yeah, uh, and I don't mean to like uh, nickel and dime Porsche or you guys. I mean, at the end of the day, 142,000 for a new 911 is a lot. But you know, the performance envelope of that car is so incredible uh, that you know, if you were to compare, it, let's say, to a Lamborghini or a McLaren, right, which that directly competes with in some regard, you're still you know, hundred thousand dollars less than uh, a comparable McLaren. Uh, and you know, obviously, a McLaren is a little bit more exotic. Uh, but at the same time, in terms of performance, they're very similar. And, uh, you know, we've driven both. Uh, and the, 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 the magic in a 911, to me at least, Tommy, is unlike a McLaren, is that, you know, McLaren is a very high-performance automobile uh, that, you know, is somewhat exotic and 
to be honest, can be a pain in the ass to drive around town, right? It's, it's very high strung. It's like a thoroughbred vehicle that doesn't come to life until maybe 80 miles an hour, at which point it's just phenomenal. Uh, and, you know, just a lot of fun by getting in and out of it using the kind of, I would call it relatively simple infotainment. Um, can be daunting if you're using it as a daily driver, whereas a 911 has this incredible performance envelope where it takes it from uh, something you can actually drive every day and use every day to go to the grocery store and get some milk all the way to a track day uh, and, and feel comfortable. And so, so, you know, so yeah, you're paying a lot, but, you know, compared to the competition, you're getting a lot. So I think people are going to be very confused at this point. Right. Why? Because most people don't think of 911 and McLaren in anywhere the same same sentence. Well, a 911 Turbo directly competes with like a 570. Yes, but I, I mean, I think the magic of the 911 is you don't need the Turbo to compete with like a 570 because even though the rating on paper is pretty um, tame on a 911, they shoot above their weight class. So if you've ever seen um, some drag racing out there, even like a, a, a C2S, like a Carrera S or Carrera 4S, will we'll give some of the slower McLaren the run for their money. And that's before you get to the insane turbos. I mean, a turbo will give some of the fastest supercars a run for their money. So I, I think that's kind of how you can equate them as being good value. But if you compare them to something like the new C8 Corvette, right, maybe the performance isn't as incredible dollar for dollar. Yeah, so, so two things there. First, um, I think the one that we had, Porsche rates from zero to 60, uh, in four seconds, if I, if I remember right. And I think Porsche usually underrates their cars. And, you know, we've driven a lot of quick cars, and I have a good sense. I think I can pretty, and I'm not trying to be boastful here, it's just, you know, experience. You do it enough, you kind of get to figure it out. And I can usually tell a sub four second car from a, you know, a more than four second car. And when we floored that thing getting on the highway, basically did the launch control, uh, that was not four seconds. I started to get tunnel vision, and tunnel vi when I get tunnel vision, that's a sub four second car. On paper, so it's a twin turbo Boxer Six, right? Three liter, uh, 379 horsepower, 331 pound feet of torque. Which, once again, those numbers would have been impressive 20 years ago. Today, like you're in Kia Stinger numbers in some cases, but I just don't believe those numbers. I mean, I, the tunnel vision you get in the Targa Four, which is on paper one of, if not the slowest 911s they make, is berserk. It's insane. I mean, you, you're you at a stoplight, put in Sport Plus, uh, plant the brake, floor the throttle, let go. I mean, it feels like it's a mid-three second car, genuinely. I mean, we were at sea level and we didn't have any of our performance testing data, but like you said, see that the pads, the thing just is remarkably fast. It's incredible how well it hooks up. And keep in mind, it's one of the slowest 060 Porsche 911s out there because uh, I think when we looked up the specs, the Targa top adds about 200 pounds, give or take. Yeah, it's a lot weight. of weight. And then once upon a time, a Targa used to be just kind of, you know, the, the middle section of the roof between the A and the B pillar would remove and you would have this open section. Now, of course, uh, the new 911, and I think it started in the previous generation, uh, they made it into this like incredible mechanical ballet where you hit the button uh, and the first thing that happens is this compartment opens up. And you, you can watch this on our video in the back so the back part lifts open then these two little like winglets open up on the side uh, and then the entire top folds into itself and behind the second well behind the second row it is a second row of seats uh, and then the little winglets close and then the back end closes uh, and it does it all in like what 19 seconds i think I just like it doesn't compute in my brain the the math and the specs between the real world. I mean, it's a hard thing to describe because the ours weighed thirty six hundred and fifty eight pounds. If you look at the spec sheet here, with three hundred thirty one pound feet of torque, like this should have been a pretty you know quick car, but nothing insane. But it was. I mean, it felt insane when you really get on it, which is just crazy. I couldn't imagine what it'd be like driving a C four S, let alone a turbo. I mean, that's got to be just. Ugh. Mind blowing. So, so you you know you mentioned the other thing, which is a Corvette. So you know, in terms of a Corvette, one hundred and forty-two thousand is a lot of money, right? Which is what ours was, and a Corvette convertible costs a lot less than that, and basically is a, it's a full-on convertible versus just a Targa. So compared to a McLaren, it's a bargain, but compared to a Corvette, it's very expensive. And the question is, um, you know, is it worth one hundred and forty-two thousand? Uh, and I think if you're a Porsche uh, uh, fan, Porsche file, uh, then the answer is absolutely yes, because th there is nothing else that's like that, right? I mean, the Corvette is now a mid-engined uh, V8, uh, uh, but the Porsche is a rear-engined, right? Which the difference being, of course, that in a mid-engine, the engine sits kind of above the rear wheels, whereas in a rear-engine, it sits behind the rear wheels. Uh, and there is a definite sense 
of all that weight back there, which I think is a good thing because you really have a sense of the car being pushed as opposed to the car being pulled. Now, purists in the sports car world will say you want that engine to be mid-engine because then the center of the mass of the car is in the center and when you're going around a turn it kind of rotates around that mass but porsche has done i think almost mystical things with uh, making that uh you know tail happy weight disappear when you're going around a corner it's it's it, i don't think you're going to convince none of the people listening to this podcast unless you really get porsches are, are going to um necessarily understand why the 911 is some sixty thousand dollars more than you know uh, a uh, a Corvette because it's a really hard thing to explain and convey. I mean, the Corvette on paper is a huge amount of performance and uh, features and just all around value compared to the Porsche, but the Porsche is like if if you're a 911 guy, I mean, there's no substitute. And and I think I, I I'm kind of starting to understand the appeal of the 911 because you get in the thing and it feels like it's better made than any other car I've ever been in. I mean, any every switch you touch is the like. There's no there's no cost saved anywhere. You get in the Corvette and it's really nice, but you can still feel some scratchy plastics and some of the switches are a little chintzy. You get a 911, like everything you touch is either aluminum or it's leather or it's more aluminum or it's like an exposed bolt head that's stainless steel and is there on purpose. I mean, it's like there's a sense of quality and longevity. And you hit a bump and it's like thunk and there's not a single other sound. And I feel like it would be like that some 90, 100,000 miles down the road. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree, Tommy. Uh, you know, we've owned a bunch of uh, older Porsches, um, including uh, a couple of Boxsters, the 996, uh, and Porsche knows how to screw a car together. I mean, one of the beauties of that brand is that, that they're very well built. Uh, they used to be kind of hand built until the 996 and they became more automated, but nevertheless, they're still really well screwed together vehicles, and you do have a sense for that in the car. Um, the funny thing is, is like if you look at um, JD Power initial survey quality yeah, surveys. Yeah, Porsche is always ranked up yeah, there. There was like one or two, or or at least three. I mean, they're uh, it's it's not a brand you typically associate with, you know, ultimate in in reliability. But for the most part, I think they're they're really pretty solid cars. Yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, so you know, I, I guess even though it's a lot of money, um, and even though they do depreciate pretty quickly, right? The uh, not as quickly as some other vehicles, but they do depreciate pretty quickly. If you buy that, if you were to pay sticker for that one that we had at 142,000, you know, a couple of years from now it's going to be worth probably you know 100,000, and a couple of years after that it's going to be worth more like in the 90 range. Right. So you know, so the, the depreciation is there, but at some point it will bounce up and they do come back up. Um, it's like it's relative to, I mean, like a Land Cruiser, right? A Land Cruiser is not going to depreciate. But if you look at uh, other very expensive vehicles, I mean, if you look at stuff from like Mercedes, all of the Mercedes S63s and those kind of things, those really depreciate quickly. Full-size Range Rovers, right? Those are also often, in some cases, over 120 grand. Those are like rocks. Uh, I think the Porsche, because they don't change them that much, uh, you know, in terms of design and the overall feel, I don't think they depreciate as fast as some of the other ultra-luxury cars in that kind of price range. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so, so anyway, let's let's get back to our story. So we picked it up and uh, you know got in it, uh, and immediately I, I had a Ford getting onto the highway. And um, the other thing that's kind of polarizing is the sound, right? There is definitely uh, a unique sound to that uh, Boxer uh, six-cylinder. Now that it's turbocharged, no, almost almost no lag. I couldn't, you know, once upon a time, of course. Uh, the 930 um, had tremendous amounts of lag. When I was growing up, that was the you know that was the original whale tail turbo, that you literally had to wait like two seconds for the turbos to, to for the turbo at that point to come on, and then you know it would uh, it would light up those rear tires. And if you're going around a turn, you'd get that snap over steer, and you'd you'd be dead or you'd be off the road. Uh, but now there's no turbo lag. It just you know, hunkers down, it kind of like, it's almost like it, it squats down and just takes off. Uh, and the sound is unusual. I mean, it's, you know, I would say it's not as pleasing as a Corvette. There's just something about a V8 that is hard to uh, not like, right? There's kind of that lumpy quality that, that's very visceral. Uh, but it's, um, you know, it's like, it's like the difference between, uh, uh, I'm going to give you, if, if the V8 is chocolate, right, mm -hmm. then this might be like, Pistachio. Yeah, that's right? true. Right? Yeah, it's, that's it's, it's not bad, it's different. And if you love pistachio ice cream, uh, then that is a, a certainly a unique sound that, that you will love. I mean, um, it doesn't sound like anything else. I mean, no. It's got a very... Uh, so the new 911s now are all turbocharged. Yep. So, you know, it used to be 
Uh, even a few years ago, uh, the 911 was naturally aspirated and then the turbo was turbocharged. But now every 911 is turbocharged, regardless if it's the, the C2 or the Top Dog Turbo S. Um, and that changes the sound a little bit because you do get a little bit of turbo hiss. Um, but it still is very similar, so we have like an, we'll talk about it, it's like we have an 87 911. Like it's, it doesn't really sound all that different from the old 911. Well, you even. can draw a direct line from the first one to the one. Yeah, 10, line. 20 years ago, I mean, the yeah. sound is still pretty much the same, even with the air-cooled, water-cooled thing. Um, so th there's also the sports exhaust, which we had. Uh, there's a couple different exhausts, depending on which one you get, but um, the base model just has one mode. The, the sports one, you can engage like little baffles, right? And then it becomes really, really loud. Uh, and we drove it around pretty much the entire week at, with the, the normal exhaust turned on. Because the sports exhaust is a little shouty, and it's a little screamy, and you're already in an expensive car, like I didn't really want to draw attention to it. So we just left it in normal mode. But the sports exhaust really lets it scream. And it's got that classic 911 feature where the, the power is much more consistent with the turbos um, below like 4,000 RPM. So on the old ones, um, like the 996 we had, if you wanted to accelerate at any kind of brisk rate, you had to be over like 3,500, 4,000 RPM or nothing would happen. But the turbos mean that now you've got good torque down low, but they still pull like hell all the way up to the red line at 7,000. Um, so you still have that classic 911, like it's building, it's building, it's building, all the way until you have to shift. And that's a cool thing. But now you have more torque down low, which is a, also a great thing. Yeah. Uh like I say, it's you know, it's if you love pistachio, you're gonna love it. If you love chocolate, you're probably not gonna be that impressed by it. Uh, but um, ours had the sports exhaust, uh, and it also had um, the uh, exhaust note that you could change, which actually didn't make much of a difference. If I were buying it, I don't think I would um, actually get that feature. I just think it sounds good no matter what you do, and you don't need that kind of deeper rumble. Mm -hmm. uh, the one, the one feature that it did have, which I thought was kind of a pain in the ass, and I first saw it in the Corvette, and then when we started driving it around, I found it extremely useful was the ability to raise the front end. So when you're going over speed bumps or you're, you know, you're, you're approaching like a driveway that's a little bit more um, raked, uh, you can actually raise the front. And like the Corvette, the other thing it'll do is it'll memorize that location. So, like for instance, at our hotel in Santa Barbara, every time we got there, once we once we memorize the location, it would automatically lift the front end so we wouldn't scratch the bottom of the chin. So it is very low, uh, and that is a good feature. I think it was, was it 1500 or 2500 I think for it that. was like 2700 actually. It was, uh, it's well pretty worth pricey. the money. I would have definitely paid that because, you know, I'm sure it costs a lot more to replace that front end. If you, and, and the thing is so low that you will need to raise the front end over many, many obstacles in most cities. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's it, what they did is they incorporated this little like plastic lip down there. So even if you do scrape, you're really just scraping this little plastic. Um, that's like a little extrusion. So you're not really gr grinding into the paint or anything. But it still is like it's an unsatisfying sound when it goes <laughs> over a speed bump. So I think that is a great point that you brought up with the front end lift. It is a low car. I mean, if we don't, we don't drive too many sports cars here in Colorado because they're just not a thing in the fleet to, to the most, for the most part. So it's a, definitely a little bit of a, a different driving adjustment when you get into it because it only has like four and a half inches of ground clearance or something, 4.7. So having that lift is just uh, it's a nice thing to protect your uh, $140,000 car. Yeah, and the other package that it, I remember the packages. So the most expensive one was a sports package, which gives you kind of more torque vectoring. It gives you a little bit more. I, I think that's probably well worth it. Uh, the, the other one that I wasn't sure of, it had this um, Bordeaux, 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 yeah, Bordeaux, red leather interior. Uh, you know that was I think two and a half thousand. Once again, um, you know, beautiful interior, but the standard color I think is black. You can also at no additional charge get like a sand color, right, and a gray color, if you were to spec one out. Um, uh, but yeah, certainly beautiful on the inside. Uh, and then you know, at the end of the day, I love the Target in California. Uh, but the added weight, I'm sure, you know, 200 pounds is a lot, Tommy. I mean, that's like the, that's like having a person, and we have found that that's definitely going to slow the vehicle down. If you're looking for ultimate performance and you're going to track your 911, the, probably the one you're going to want, as a new one at least, is the just a standard Carrera 2, uh, which has the least amount of weight and the most amount of structural rigidity. Well, probably, I mean, if you're looking for the ultimate one, you're going to want the S. Cause so the but S, it, that's what fifteen thousand dollars more. It's a big, it's a yeah. big jump, but you can get, and this is pretty neat too. Because you like fifty more horsepower ish, something like that. I think yeah. it drops the zero to sixty by somewhere in half a second. Yeah. You can get the option of the eight-speed automatic, 
And in the S, you can still get the seven-speed manual. How cool is that? In 2021, you can still get a 911 with the manual transmission. So, so, so let's talk about that. So I did a lot of thinking. Ours, of course, was automatic. Once upon a time, you know, manuals were quicker, but uh, maybe 15 years ago, an automatic became quicker than a manual. I just can't shift as fast as a computer can. Um, and, you know, I love manuals, Tommy. I, I just love them. There's something so ultimately and viscerally satisfying from shifting your own gears. Uh, feeling like you're part of the machine, like you know, you're know you controlling the machine as opposed to the machine controlling you. Uh, but having said that, uh, I, I think I would lean toward the automatic. Seven speeds, kind of a pain in the ass. I think six speeds is the is the sweet spot. I think at seven you're getting to be probably one too many gears, right? Well, it's just like a, I think seven is more of a highway fuel economy gear. Right, it's like an overdrive, I get that. Yeah. But it's but one too many and it also makes it slower. I mean, if you're getting this thing for performance, why would you want the slower one? And and in traffic, especially like, you know, when we were driving through LA, and LA is kind of locked down still, so it's not too bad, but in traffic, oh my gosh, that would be a pain in the ass shifting it yourself. So once again, it's one of those things, you know, on a perfectly beautiful day, you know, winding through the California countryside, I would want the manual, but that's going to get happen like 10% of the time. The rest of the time, I think I'd want the automatic. But, as good as the car drives, I think that the manual would suit it quite well. I mean, it's such a driver's car, right? And isn't that the driver's transmission choice? Wouldn't it make sense to get one of the last manual transmissions in a high-performance sports car? Because you, you can't get in a Corvette anymore, look, right? Look, get, get the C2S with the manual, which is going to be like 115 or something, right? Yeah, it starts at 115. It's no, no cost option, by the way, right. for the manual. Yeah, and hold on to it. And, you know, the next generation of Porsches and people are, you know madly Googling and, you know, talking to their reps. And I've been listening to a lot of podcasts trying to figure out whether this is going to be the last one that's not electrified. I suspect that it will be the last not electrified one. So if you want to get the last manual, ultimate, you know, 911 before it went to, you know, the new tech, get it. Because when you think about it, like before the 996, right, the Porsches, the, the, all the air-cooled ones are much more valuable. The 996, for some reason, you know, is, is a bargain basement 911. You can get that thing all day long for 20000 uh, But the air-cooled ones, you know, once again, before there was a seismic shift to new technology and seismic shift going from air-cooled to water-cooled. But nevertheless, in the Porsche world, I think if you do want the last 911 and you want to hold on to it that's going to be non-electrified, then that would be the one that we get. I agree completely. I mean, I think that's... Uh... I'm not saying it's a good investment because it's still going to take 40 years for it right, to sure. <laughs> appreciate, but... But if you want it as a driver, I'd say get the automatic. If you're actually going to drive it on an everyday sure. basis and you don't want to deal with you know the, the, the fun of driving a manual in stop and go traffic or the fun of driving a manual in a you know, parking garage you know, or the fun of driving a manual in downtown San Francisco, right? there's a lot of places where the manual is a pain. I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it stamps it's, it's your a man card. Thing. I get that, but nevertheless, it's still a pain. And I'm old enough now where I don't really care about having my man cards. You know, I've, I've done enough in my life where I've driven in all those situations in a manual. That, that you know what? The, you know what the? Uh, you know, I just thought of this, Tommy. You know what would be the ideal solution? What? You get the automatic, and then you get an old one like we did, and have the manual. You could do an old one. That's yeah. true. Yeah, they were all manuals for a while. Exactly. They were old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you got if you got the budget and you want two of them. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, so let's keep going with the story. So uh, of course, then you know we we took it up um, to Santa Barbara, and believe it or not, in Southern California, it started raining. Which was a weird thing. Which was a weird thing. Yeah. And then the car has different drive modes, right? Yep. Uh, and I got this message that popped up, and it said you should. Be, or you should consider putting it in wet mode. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know that the car suggested that. It was kind of interesting. I mean, there's a little dial a la a Ferrari where you can actually, you know, go from, I think it's normal to sport to sport plus to wet, right? Those are the modes, if I remember right. And that may have been part of our sport package, actually, that was on the car because I'm looking at one right now, just a normal one, yep. and it doesn't have the little drive selector. It also doesn't have the clock on the dashboard. Oh, yeah, that little, clock, that little chronograph is chrono. super expensive, yeah. Yeah, so, but yeah, so it suggested sport mode, and I think it knew that because it had... Wet mode. It, yeah, sorry, wet mode. Yep. It had, um, I think it had rain-sensing wipers. It could, we, we couldn't figure it out, whether it knew because of the wipers, it did have rain-sensing wipers, or because, like, the traction control could tell that there was slippage coming from the wheels because of, you know, we were going pretty fast. I mean, we were doing, like... 70. 
75 maybe yeah yeah mm -hmm. it was in the wet so maybe you could tell I, I don't know how it knows but it was cool that it suggested it so i put it in wet and it was fine yeah yeah i mean it, it was all wheel drive so it would have been fine and we weren't like doing 140. no no that's um, not our style no but uh yeah Even i know the car will do that i think 186 is the top speed 180 somewhere around I think there you said one we google i think it was 186. i've got it i've got it right here actually let's see target more four. more 179. Okay, one, 179. There you go. So quicker than, than, than is legally to do anywhere outside of an autobahn. Yep, that's Or a, a racetrack. Yeah, so uh, you have to get the, sp it looks like just sp sp pricing one out right now, you have to get the sport package to get the little we'll drive get, selector. The little drive selector? If you're ever bored, just jump on the Porsche 911 configurator, configurator. And dream. Uh, I can't talk now. Yeah, and you can just, I mean, you could spend hours just building your ideal car and and daydreaming. And the cool thing too is, I think they've put it on hold, but you can take European delivery of these 911s, right? If you wanted yeah. to, you could pick it up at the factory. Yeah, you can, but it's on hold right now because of COVID. I'm not sure getting over to Europe would be a great uh, time, time of the uh, time right now, but you could European delivery it, which would be a great story. So uh, yeah, that's always in the back of my mind. I'd love to actually go get one if it wasn't, you know, I guess we bought the cheapest 911 would make for a good story. Even though the cheapest 911 is still $99,200. 99, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it doesn't, get this, if you buy the cheapest 911, which is a big deal for me, it doesn't have lumbar support. Yeah, you see, and I have a bad back, so I kind of desperately need that. I think you... You have to upgrade the, the, the to the 14-way seats. Yeah, because of sports seats, which are four-way. Yeah. And you can adjust manual four-aft adjustment, and you can also electronic adjustment of the backrest and seat height. But if you kind want... of crazy you could get a car. Sorry, Porsche, but dude, a car for 99000 no lumbar support. Ouch. Well, yeah, what the heck? The other thing ours didn't have, which I thought for a $142,000 car was odd, was uh, phone charging, that automatic little phone charger. Oh, I hated that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was... I would have liked to have... It had like a, a spot in the center console where I had like the outline of a phone, and yeah. you could put your phone in there. But no charger. But I think that's where the charger should go if you spec it. Yeah. But no, nope, didn't All right. charge. All right, so now we're talking about kind of the things we didn't like. The one thing... You know, Porsches um, have always been, I believe, I've never driven the really, really, actually I did. I drove a 356 replica. Remember? I drove yeah, the bathtub. The bathtub, yeah, yeah. it was a replica. But the, the, the pedals have always been uh, hinged uh, from the from, bottom. From the bottom versus the top. Uh, and the one thing I did find about this car was that, that my, my foot, my right foot got a little tired. There was a lot of resistance on the spring pushing it forward. Did you find that too? I, I, almost I too did. much. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to sound, you know, like, like an a, old man, I know. Like a baby here, but yeah, there was like a really big resistance on the Yeah, it gets old after like a couple hours. You're like, eh. not not really sure what that was about, but there's a lot of resistance in the throttle pedal when you if you're doing like long distance cruising, your thigh starts to get a little uh, worn out from pushing down the pedal so hard. That was a, 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 an odd thing for sure. The other thing I didn't like is I mean the rear seats are useless. Yeah, I mean, we did put our luggage back there. Yeah, they're good, for, good for luggage, and yeah. you can fold them down, and then like it's golf, really it good. used to be golf clubs. If you still play golf, you can but throw you them back can, there. But I mean, you're not gonna. But the front is actually very deep. The front is very deep. deep. Yeah, very so big we got, front. We got, we got our camera gear in the front, and, and we, we we were averaging. I think on our trip, we were averaging 18 or 19 miles per gallon. It says I think 20. I think 20 or 21 is the MPG, which is you know, not grand, but. You know, for a car that has supercar performance, is not bad when you're in, you know, into the 20s. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was fine actually for the uh, amount of performance that it had. And um, some other things I didn't like. There were, uh, the infotainment was okay. I think it was okay, but it was a little bit clunky here and there. Um, like for example, the the radio tuning and the, the changing of stations was a little bit. You had to go through different menus. That was a slight slight nuisance to get to the. Yeah, and the other thing I hate, and this is a big pet peeve of mine, just if I, if I'm if I like set mine to my favorites, right? Leave it there. Don't don't go back to wherever the factory setting is, right? Mm -hmm. So you always have if you wanted to go to like the list of like serious state like you know satellite radio stations, you always had to go back and hit that. And it took like three steps. Just leave it there, guys. This engineers, knock it off. Don't go back to your default home screen. I really don't uh, don't appreciate that. Just, it's there for a reason. Let me keep it there. Yeah, I agree. I, I, think, I think you're right. And maybe you can. Maybe there's a setting. But you know what? When you have a setting so far deep in a menu that you don't know it's there, you might as well not have it. Right? That's, that's, that's kind of the essence of having something that's intuitive. If I have to go and start digging into it, figuring out if I have to, you know, set a default for my home screen, it's not working. 
Yeah, I, I can understand where you're coming from on that. I mean, overall, it was it. You you really got to kind of dig to find issues with it because it was a really excellent car. I think the biggest issue is that it's pretty expensive, and relative to some of its competition. Well, well the other thing, look, we're, we live on YouTube, right? And if you're listening to this on our podcast, you can also watch this on YouTube. And Tommy's going through the configurator so you can actually see how much these cars cost. But we live on YouTube, and you know the the, the, the car du jour. <laughs> Or is it the car of the year is a McLaren right now, right? Everybody's got to have a McLaren, right? You think of Street Speed, you think of the Strand Man, you think of, I don't know, Vehicle Virgins when he was doing his stuff, right? They all have McLarens. And the one thing about a 911, uh, especially in California, especially in Santa Barbara, which is, you know, like California on steroids, um, it's not going to get noticed. You, you, you know, you, a McLaren, you start up, it's loud, you drive down the street, you will get noticed. Same thing with a Lamborghini. Right, you will not get. I mean, people who know know, but for the most part, you know, we're driving a brand new 911, and most people were like, "Eh, hey, another Porsche." And I think it is worth noting that some people do buy a high performance car to be seen in. Yeah, right? sure. I think that is certainly. A, but this a, is not the one. No, this is not the one. And like I said, the other downside is you do have to pay a lot of money for kind of silly stuff. Like it's a thousand bucks if you want the owner's manual pouch and carbon fiber. <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's for really, discerning buyers, Tommy. If you want the door sells door sills in carbon fiber, it's thirteen hundred bucks. I mean, yeah, you, you you really it's easy to to pick out some cool options you like, and then end up with a car that's one hundred ninety thousand dollars. The the other thing I don't like about it, and McLaren does this as well, is um, you know we were trying to look at the engine because it's you know these boxers are beautiful engines, right? Yep. I've seen them out out of the, the car, and they're just gorgeous, even if you just see them sitting there, right? And especially the 996, which would detonate itself uh, when the IMS went. So those were always out of the Porsche. But anyway, uh, they're beautiful engines, and there's no way to look at the thing. Right? Right. There's it's a little totally flap hidden. that opens up that lets you, just like a boxer, right, lets you, uh, boxer, lets you get at the oil, and I think, uh, what's the other one, engine uh, coolant, mm -hmm. right? But that's it. There's, it's there, but you can't see it. This at is, least with the boxer, you can eventually get at it. This is pretty crazy. I'm looking at the European delivery options here. Yeah. And there are four different options. So you can do Porsche Experience delivery in Atlanta. Yeah. That's 550 bucks. You can do the Porsche Experience delivery in LA. So it's 625 bucks. You can do European delivery in Leipzig. Leipzig, yep. Or you can do it in Zuffenhausen. Where they're built. And looking at the pictures here, uh, they, they give you like your own little cubicle. It's like a little special room yeah. with like these trendy chairs and the car is under a cover and then I guess you do like a big reveal. Uh, pull the covers off the car. That's pretty funky. I want to do that now, Tommy. <laughs> That's pretty cool. We gotta make a lot more videos. <laughs> yeah, we gotta we gotta start really cranking through these videos. Better, better get more friends to start listening hey, to these podcasts. I think we had the perfect Porsche experience picking it up at the airport. That's great. Like yeah, it was a dream. It was really a, a nice little trip. Now let's talk about um, um, let's, before we wrap up the the, the the experience. You know, we did take it to Solvang uh, and to Ojai, mm -hmm. uh, so we did get it on some twisty roads. Uh, the steering, you know. So when we bought the 996, I remember sitting in the in the wheel and I thought to myself, there's something wrong with this steering. Uh, and it turns out that was the last of the mechanical steering, right, where it wasn't uh, electric yet. Okay. Uh, and what was wrong with it was that it actually had road feel, ah. right? It actually you could actually like like feel, you know, the the camber of the road. You could feel what the front tires were doing. Uh, I would say with this one, it was. I mean, you know, there's that cliche like on rails. It's certainly on rails when you take a corner. But I would I would say. Uh, the steering is a little bit numb. It's a little bit heavy, right? Okay. What, what's happened is you replaced feel with weight, uh, and the two aren't the same. Uh, and the other, these are just now. Now I'm just really nitpicking. Don't get me wrong. I love this car. Uh, I was so sad when we, you know, said goodbye to it. Uh, getting up in the morning, knowing that I got to drive it even to breakfast, put a huge smile on my face. So I'm just being nitpicky here. Uh, but this is the problem with all of them. You know, the, the performance envelope is so high on this car that you got to get into some serious speeds before you can actually, uh, you know, feel the car working and start to appreciate all the engineering that went into it. Yeah. And for the most part, you can't do that on public roads legally. Yeah, you really got to be pushing it before. I mean, before it like comes, you know, comes into its own. But I, I will say, I mean. From my limited experience behind Indian 11, I was just like blown away. I mean, it was incredible. If if you've never driven one, like I haven't driven one, a newer one, I was just like, wow. I mean, uh, you could take any turn at seemingly any speed, and it would just just go whoop, just <laughs> zip you right yeah, along. It's yeah, crazy. And, and, and you know, there's some beautiful roads in California. Of course, the issue is oftentimes if you're doing that, you're breaking the law. Or if you're not breaking the law, it won't take you long before you you you, you know you. 
you stumble upon a, like a minivan or a Sonata yeah. <laughs> that's enjoying the, the drive, <laughs> and, and you're you're not going to be able to pass them legally at least. That's true. But yeah, but the um, but but the limits are are so high. Uh, it's a beautifully handcrafted. Um, it's not handcrafted, but it, it's got that handcrafted feel. Um, it feels like it's going to, you know, be around a long time. It'll probably outlive most owners, which is pretty cool as well. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a gorgeous car. I, I have deep Porsche lust now, uh, and I got to thank uh, both Calvin and Luke over at Porsche for letting us borrow it. Uh, so thank you, gentlemen. Uh, that was great. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, let's talk about our old one. Yes, yeah, so we bought a really old one. It's a 1987. And if you have been following any of the classic Porsche markets, you know in the recent years it just exploded. I mean, for a while they were like $15,000 cars, and then seemingly overnight they were like $50,000 cars for even a pretty tiny one. Um, so we found one, and once again it would be way too expensive, but we found one of the cheapest ones in the country, and it's an 87. Um, I think the official code is 911G. It's, it's, got, a, it's got the good gearbox. Let's get the cabriolet, yeah. So in the 87, they went to a much more updated uh, Five -speed transmission. Manual. I mean, it looks like pretty much every other 911 that you can think of in the air, like the vertical headlights, and uh, it's, it's it's a convertible, so it's got the soft top, and in the back, it also has the whale tail, and it has a mystery wide body kit on it, which we hope is factory, but we're going to do some diving into that. But it's a cool looking car, needs a lot of love, but we'll get it up to snuff, and for 35k, which is a crazy number, I know, it's one of the, was one of the cheapest clean title running and driving ones anywhere. Yeah, so let's talk about kind of the process of buying it. Uh, it took me about two years to find it. We've been kind of going through Porsches over the last 10 years, uh, buying them and then selling them. And eventually I decided, you know, you had to have the air-cooled one. So this was a good uh, generation to get. We did our research. We knew what we wanted. Uh, the one thing immediately I didn't want to do was buy it from a dealer. And I was talking to Tommy about this, right? Um, you know, Craigslist is kind of... Um, uh, a wild west, right? You, you never know what you're getting, and so you got to go in there with your eyes open. But when it comes to used Porsche dealers, Tommy, it, you just know you're going to get, you know what? <laughs> so, so, so at least Craigslist, you have a chance of trying to get a decent vehicle, and you know the history of the vehicle, which is hugely important. You end up at a used Porsche dealership, and I haven't, you know, I, you know, the ones I've been to, they tend to go, they tend to be like typical used car lots, and the, this tends to be the most expensive car, and immediately the car is at least ten thousand higher than the market value immediately. And, and yeah. then very rarely will you get any information about it. So the one thing I wanted was a car that had a provenance uh, that you know was in the owner's hands for a long time. And this car had been in, it, you know, we did the Carfax, so it started in LA, and then it had been in Colorado for like the last 25 years. And the guy's brother owned it before, he owned it for 10 years, I think the brother owned it for 20 years. So we knew 20 years of like ownership, right? What you don't want is one that, that, that's been traded and gone through auctions and gone through dealers, right? That's just the, 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 the nightmare of, of, because let's face it, the second you buy a classic Porsche, it's going to be expensive. Yeah, and we know it's going to be Very expensive. Very expensive. Yeah. We know that. We know that. And we've got good mechanics and it's still going to be expensive. Uh, you know, so uh, when this one popped up on Craigslist, I was amazed. And, so, and if you guys know, we, we can figure it out. And if you guys can help us figure it out, we'd appreciate it. So. Uh, you know, in the 80s, they made a slant nose, right, which are valu very valuable. Very right valuable. Now, way beyond our budget. And it had this funky, like, um, wide body uh, and a whale tail. So ours basically is a half of a slant nose. So it doesn't have the slant nose, but it's got the wide body with the slits in front of the rear wheels, which is what the wide, nose ha wide body had. Uh, for the flat nose, the regular white body didn't have those slits, and it's got the whale tail. Now we did uh, do uh, a little research, right? And we did get a hold of the original uh, configurate configurator. So what you can do is Porsche on the underside of the hood yeah. actually publishes a little build code so you can decode the options. Ours is missing because it's been repainted. Painted, yeah. But I was able to plug a VIN into um, the, this database and was able to spit out all the original configuration codes, like the exterior color, the interior color, the wheel options, whatever. Um, and it said it had originally uh, the uh, front spoiler and the rear spoiler, but it didn't have the code for the wide body kit. But then after doing some more digging, we found someone that said, well, you could actually option it with the uh, slant nose wide body kit as part of this uh, Porsche exclusive group. Yeah, it used to be called, I think, Special Wishes. So back in the day, you could go to Porsche and you said you could say actually because they were hand built right you could say I want my car to be like this you can still do it I mean you can you, still do it yeah, yeah you still do there's it still that it's program. called ex exclusive or executive now I think it's exclusive like if you yeah. want a certain color you can 
pay a huge right. amount of money and then they'll, they'll make you that color. But back then, um, you know, the, the code for that was not in, the, in, the, in that build sheet. So there is, an there is a potential that the wide body that we have was done as a special w wish uh, by Porsche. Uh, most of the wide bodies that were done after the fact are fiberglass. Yeah, and this one's all steel. Which this is one's all steel, so it'd be really hard to retrofit that. But then again, our car was repainted, so maybe somebody did buy the wide body Porsche parts and put it on afterwards. We, do, we, knew, we know it came with the whale tail. Um, so that that was original to it, uh, but we don't know about the white body. We're trying to. It's got these like very fat sills on the side. And it's got these like, like I said, like these slits in front of the wheels that look like air slits, but they're not. Um, so like I say, if you looked at a slant nose, uh, that's what it would look like without the slant nose. It has some issues. So, like the top went up, but then one of the motors failed trying Wouldn't to put it down. back down. Nope. Yep. The rear window zipper is broken, so we can't zip up the rear window. Yeah. Which is a big problem. Uh, the interior is pretty tatty. It's got about, we bought it with 100,000 miles or so. 95K. It's yeah. got the worst steering wheel you've ever seen on yeah. it. Yeah. Somebody it, retrofitted a really, it said, I think, race on it or uh, something. It's horrible. It's got a terrible aftermarket radio on it. Uh, the wheels are off of, I think, a 964. They're these horrible chrome things. Um, but it still is, you know, runs pretty well, drives pretty well, it starts up every time. Um, it was full of mouse poop. Yeah, I spent the weekend uh, back <laughs> mouse poop, thing. which was very satisfying, actually. Yeah, but <laughs> it's going to be a fun project, and I'm sure we're going to lose our bacon on it, uh, and we'll be sure to take you along the way. Yeah, it'll be on TFL Classics, so if you want to see it, head over to TFL Classics. Tommy did the first uh, video of it. Uh, you know, it's, it feels very, with those chrome, the shiny wheels, and that funky fat the wheel tail and the weird side sills. It feels very like Miami Vice-ish, especially since it's kind of a dark blue with a white interior. Yes, absolutely. It's it's very, uh, very 80s. <laughs> very sure. 80s, yeah. <laughs> well, be sure to check those out over at TiVo Classics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as always, thank you so much for listening to our podcast today. Let us know what you think in the comment section below, something a little bit different. Yeah, and uh, thank you again to Porsche for lending us the 911. Uh, and follow along as we uh, try to decode the mystery of ours. If you know what that is, we'd love to hear from you. We've had people in the comments and say obvious fake other people have said obviously real uh, we don't know we really don't know I guess maybe we need to get a hold of Porsche and see if they have better records yep we'll do guys all right we'll see you next time ciao